recording, streaming, and we are live, I think. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me to this. Should we spend just 30 seconds kind of introducing each other so people know who, who they're actually watching? Yeah, sure. Um, I am Nikita. I am Closure Programmer. Uh, about to start building uh, you know, UI framework. Um, that's it. <laughs> and thanks Ra, right. for coming to the stream. Uh, we want to introduce yourself. Sure, yeah, I'm Rafe Levine. I'm currently a Reith Levine. I'm currently a research uh, software engineer on the, again, the main thing that I'm working on these days is uh, GPU rendering, uh, rendering of fonts, or of, of 2D graphics, including fonts. Also, have spent a lot of time over the past few years, work few years, working on Druid, which is the UI frame that we're also using as part of the Rune Bender font editor. So, so I've um, spent a lot of time looking into the, the, the details, the guts, I think, of UI, UI frameworks. And uh, I'm very interested in uh, having this conversation. I read your blog post, I think, I think the format of this live stream from my perspective to a large extent is a discussion to follow follow up on the thoughts on Clojure UI framework blog post that you wrote, what was that, weeks ago? Cool, um, yeah, uh, so uh, we are going to do that. Uh, before we start, there is, I don't think YouTube stream has started. The recording is starting, so it's all oh. will be published. Let me oh. figure out what's wrong with the YouTube. Okay. Um, okay. Something, something. I finally remembered. I don't know how young people do that, but. Uh, <laughs> you live control room. Okay. And excellent connection. It says we have a. Uh, Streaming key. Why doesn't this start? Stream health. Stream is healthy. Wait. Okay. Oh, there is button go live. Connect streaming software to go live. We are ready to go live. Okay. All right. Let me click the button. And now we are live. Now we are live. No? No. Still not. Okay. I'm still, still not seeing it on here. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a <laughs> delay, but. Right, now I see it on my, on my screen. So I think we are live. Should yeah. we do introductions again or, or just have that as part of the recording? Let's start from let's, scratch. Let's start from scratch, yeah. Start uh, from scratch. Yeah, okay, so uh, this is, uh, I am Nikita. I am Closure Programmer. We I, uh, invited Raf Levin to do a discussion on uh, UI frameworks, closure and non-closure. So yeah, uh, I, I don't know what else to say about me. Uh, Raf, do you want to do introduction to yourself? Sure, happy to introduce, introduce myself. So I'm uh, um, Rafe Levine. I work on the Google Fonts team as a research software engineer. And, here, and my current main focus is, is GPU rendering of fonts and 2D graphics. And I've also been involved for quite some time in the Druid UI framework, which is written in Rust, uh, which among other things we're using as the basis of the Rune Bender font editor. So it's related to my, to my work on the Google Fonts team there. So I saw your blog post, was it about two, th was it about two three weeks ago? Closure UI framework, and I saw a lot of interesting ideas there. And I think from my perspective, I think from my perspective, it's just to have a discussion about the ideas and, you know, kind of, I think the time is right for a new desktop UI framework. And I, I'm happy to talk about the details of how to make that happen. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think uh, the time is right. I was thinking to start with, uh, with a question, like you have your own font, right? Uh, in Consolata mm -hmm. and uh, it's a great font. And, and I also are like, as a basis for UI framework, you're writing a program 
to design fonts. So which came first, like UI framework, the need for font design tool, or the font itself, like which one of the three was initial uh, motivation? Oh, uh, uh, they're, they're all interrelated. So I think, um, you know, I've been interested in fonts and, 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 in fonts and, and, and working on this pretty much my entire career. And um, you know, in Consolata itself was mostly designed. In Consolata itself was mostly designed at some time. Although the upgrade to it being variable font was a couple years ago, and I used um, primarily a Glyphs app, the uh, uh, Mac uh, font editor for that. I did a little bit of work on my own font tools in Rust for that. But um, in terms of UI frameworks, I think. My work on UI frameworks in Rust, or, or you know, the kind of more recent iteration these, because I, also I was involved in GTK like over 20 years ago. I was involved a little bit in GIMP, did a little bit of work on GTK, including some work on Canvas and anti-alias rendering. They kind of ended up moving a different direction. They ended up in a different direction. They ended up using Kyra, their main 2D renderer. But you know, I was involved in in at least some of those discussions. So it's it's a it's a interest that goes back a long time. But the rest work, I think, goes back to Xi Editor of really desiring to make a modern, high-tech, high-performance text editor in Rust. And the early in Rust and the early making a UI framework is too hard. Let's have a dual process uh, arrangement. So there's a core that's written in Rust which is platform independent, and then you build the UI in the, techno in the technology that, so on the Macintosh, you build it, actually we built uh, Zymac using, um, not Swift UI, but in Swift using Coco. And then the idea was you would build all the other uh, front ends in different, different UIs and, you know, the native UI toolkit. And I learned a lot about that. Like one of the things that I learned is the limitation the limitations of UI toolkits that exist, they're not that great. They're kind of stuck. I, and, and I think, um, um, so, so in terms of Druid, we had a good Mac uh, front end for Xi. We had a lot of work going on on the Linux side. There was a pretty good GTK uh, front end and the K uh, front end. And there was good building a Windows front end I started building it in Rust, and I started building it very low level, but using the capabilities of the Windows platform. So um, direct write for the text processing, direct 2D for the text rendering, and really just trying to make it as much of a native Windows uh, application as possible. And I was finding, like, I kind of was enjoying it, that it felt like Rust on Windows was a really good way of building UIs and also building everything into one binary was better than having the two processes speaking over a remote procedure call. That was, that was a source of complexity, a source of friction. Uh, and, you know, ultimately I came to the conclusion that you just build everything in, in the case of Xi Editor Rust. And um, so, so that was work. The, the Xi Win stuff was maybe two, th three or four years ago. And then that evolved. Uh, into uh, Druid. And so Druid existed before the, the font editor uh, in terms of that question. Cool. And uh, okay, uh, very short, like personal question before we move completely to UI stuff, uh, because it kind of relates to, so you said you work on Google Fonts team and how, how do you, are you guys maybe working on, and you committed to Rust, so maybe working on a uh, font compilation pipeline in written in Rust? Because I used Python 1 and Python 1 is horrible. It's super slow. Mm -hmm. Is there something yeah, in absolutely. this? Yes, okay. yes cool, cool. certainly. So, so, I mean, we're doing a lot of stuff on the team and uh, Python is still the kind of main language for font uh, engineering, uh, font compilation. But as you say, you know, it's slow. It has, I think there's some other problems. I think you get into trouble with it being dynamically typed that you, it's you, it's not always reliable. Certainly uh, you don't want to use it in production. You know, you, you, you don't want to use it like in a web browser or in a UI tool toolkit uh, uh, or a serving pipeline, uh, even though we have done those things. So yeah, we're working 
uh, on uh, a fairly wide suite of tools to do font compilation uh, in Rust. And if you're interested in that, uh, definitely feel free to reach out. Anybody who's great, great. Now, I am I'm probably most interested to like as a user, but uh, yeah, I, I don't have resources right now to help, but yeah, I'm very interested sure. because yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, otherwise it's very slow. Okay, cool. So you said, uh, you said the phrase, you think UI frameworks are stuck. Do you mean that by that nothing new is developed or something like new ideas not explored or what, what do you mean by that? Well, maybe that's overstating it a little bit um, because certainly we have Swift UI and that's new and that's, you know, that's exciting. I think, um, you know, a lot of the current architecture of Druid is in fact pretty, pretty strongly inspired by Swift UI, but um, that's not cross-platform. That's when that's Mac only essentially, or Mac and, uh, you know, iOS only. And so, you know, uh, a lot of the, underlying technology, the rendering technology also is not moving forward, uh, is also kind of stuck. And there's, there's a number of pieces of basic infrastructure that are really important that are not moving forward like they should be. So one of, maybe jumping ahead a little bit, one of the things that we've started to invest in uh, recently, um, we've, we've actually just signed on Matt Campbell to work on access kit, accessibility. and I think that that, so accessibility is just one of those things that's really, really important. I don't think you can call a UI toolkit real, like production ready, unless it has some good accessibility story on it. And historically what's, what's happened there is that there's pretty good accessibility support that's very platform specific. So if you're on Windows, there's accessibility APIs on Windows. If you're on Mac, there's accessibility APIs on Mac. But in terms of cross-platform, the only thing that's reasonably good, there is, I, I, I don't wanna um, understate what Qt has done. Qt has done pretty good work on this, but uh, there's no really good cross-platform API for accessibility. And that's exactly what Access Kit is, you know, is, is aiming to do. So there's like a bunch of ways in which you're not, especially if you're, if you're trying to do, let me phrase it this way. If you're trying to do cross-platform desktop GUI, that's pretty stuck. There haven't been, there aren't really good um, choices there. And what does exist, you know, the queued and various different other things, it's pretty similar to what, similar to what it was, you know, five, 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I agree with you too, but uh, yeah. And uh, it's interesting that we get uh, this new wave of new UI frameworks, uh, declarative UI frameworks, which I think is a, is a good thing, good direction to move on. But they, yeah, they all like, some of them are mobile first, some of them are like single platform or two platforms. Yeah, and uh, cross-platform is, is a good goal to um, yeah to, to pursue so that's so i think you know i want to spend a little you know i want to spend a little time in this in, time in this in this um and electron is really a fascinating fascinating development from my perspective and what i see i mean it depending on exactly what you're trying to do it's winning like it's winning like a lot of people build you know an app to do x that is creative tool communication tool and you know, and you know, it's it's built in Electron these days, and I think reasons for that. And I kind of want to go a little little deeper, like just that it's cross, like just that it's cross platform is good. There's a lot of investment that was done on accessibility in the web framework is a result of investment by the people that built the browsers. And then you know, when you use Electron, you can just you're you're basically skating off of that uh, investment, that work that was done. The rendering, the fact that like most browsers use Skia. That's um, you know, Skia is Skia is actually pretty good. It's not that bad. Uh, there's more to be talked about there. I think I don't have to convince you of that because you're using convince you of that because you're using Skia as the basis for your work as well, right? But I think there's something else about Electron that's really interesting. About Electron that's really interesting, which is that there 
And I think there's a lot that you can criticize about the DOM. Uh, and and I, I do have disagreements with it. But fundamentally, it's like an intermediate representation in a, comp in a compiler. Right? It's an architectural division to say, Below this line, you know, you're clearly specifying, you know, you're clearly specifying what you want the UI to do, and the browser engine's responsibility to render that DOM. And then above that line, you you script it however you like. There's tons and tons and tons of choices about how you script the DOM. And in, and in the JavaScript world, people have been exploring that space, like alterating the exploration of that space. So almost every kind of every kind of incremental UI layout, you know, React, um, uh, you know, what kind of tools you use to build it, tools you use to build it, uh, you know, th th those kind of exam. So uh, this is something that um, I've been I've been struggling with because Druid is not really built with a clean intermediate layer. Station. But I think that in the evolution of Druid, my future, Druid, my future thinking on Druid, I am strongly considering at representation. And I'm and one of the conversations to have is conversations to have is just kind of throwing this out there. Operation, you can think about layering it. You can think about an engine layering it. You can think about an engine in Rust, because I, I very strongly believe in Rust. And we can you can fight me on that. We can talk about it all you like. But uh, I think there are strong advantages, there's strong reasons to build that in Rust and then bind that. This is something that currently Druid does not do well at all. That currently when you do data driven UI in Rust, in Druid, you have to use the Rust native types for that and you have to really do it in Rust. There's no way to bind it uh, to Python. We've done a little or other length on, we've done a little or other languages. We've done a little exploration, but I think if intermediate representation layer, then you could imagine what you wanted to build, whatever language you like, whatever reactive architecture you liked, maybe different architectures for different problem domains, depending on what you're doing. Certainly when you're talking about writing it in different languages, what different integrations you want. So, so that's something I'm throwing out there. Okay, so uh, let me uh, ask you. So in, in several of your blog posts, you're writing uh, something along the lines like DOM is a problem in a browser and stuff like that. Uh, and you mean that as like implementation of the DOM, right? Not the idea of the DOM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah, when we talk about the problems of DOM, I, I think it's, it's, it's a few things. And so I, I think there's really good things about the DOM, like the fact that it is this, that it is this clean intermediate is a good thing. What's not good about the DOM, I would say is a few things. One, it's really complex to implement that you import all of the complexity of having to do CSS and so on and so forth. And there's some things for which that's okay, but there are other things for which it gets in the way. It's it, it adds complexity that it that doesn't pay off. Second thing that I'm thing that I'm not thrilled with on the, the programming model that you know it's very object oriented. It's very heavy that in order to implement it, you need actually dozens or probably hundreds of bytes per DOM node, and you're you have to access it in a very serial way. You can really only access it from, it from one thread, which is if you're trying to do high performance. So the, like, you know, if you're really trying to do high performance, you find that the DOM itself is one of the things that, that gets in the way of, of, of achieving that performance. But, but, but I don't think the idea of the DOM is wrong. I, I like the idea of there being an intermediate representation. I just think if you stripped it down, made it a little, cleaner, made the implementation a little bit better, then, then that would be a stronger basis for a UI. Yeah, I like I like the idea. I, I have to agree with you. I, I like the idea of the DOM as well. And I think I, I'm even thinking like, because you can do um, incrementality and state management and all this high level stuff in many different ways, it's right. maybe I shouldn't even decide how you do it and like uh, build uh, just like an end at uh, DOM level, something like DOM level, and then let other people build on top of that, maybe. But uh, the, the thing that you're saying about um, scripting on top of Rust and mm -hmm. this way I want to go all in on Clojure uh, for DOM mm -hmm. and for scripting is because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, there's value when you can implement 
some like your own DOM nodes. Like if you want mm. some tricky layout and you, you, you like you let user to code and codify it and the way right. they wanted it, right? So right. Uh, and it would be like, and, and the problem with browser async is that because it has to uh, have built-in implementation for so many cases, so it starts to weight it down. And if you don't have this problem, if you just let user uh, solve the hard cases for them and basic implementation would be super lightweight and easy and basic, uh, that might be the solution. Yeah, yeah. So that so that so that is a really interesting good point that you've made. And I think, you know, it's a trade-off. Like, it's essentially like, do you have extension points at the lower level? And for the mo point in a browser, the answer is no. You know, that you, you get, here's what you get. And then what you get is this huge, extremely rich thing where people have been proposing extensions to it for, you know, 25 years. And so hopefully what you need is in there. But if it's not, then you're kind of screwed. And then people do things like drop down to, you know, like Figma, you know, implement huge chunks of the UI bypassing the, the browser and, and just doing it in uh, WebGL or whatever. Um, so, so having, so, so that's a, that's a, a wart in, in, wart in, in the web stack saying there's one implementation that does have extension points in it. And Clojure is a fantastic language for building, you know, frameworks that you then extend in usable ways. It's like, you know, I'm, I see, you know, I'm, I see, I see. I, I missed the, the last part. I see. I, then... I see the value in okay. trying to build kind of using one language instead of stitching together, you know, lots of different things specifically so that you can then extend the lower level pieces as needed. Yeah, I, I hope it worked out. The, the only concern I have with closure is the performance. And uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Maybe I can like jump between Java and closure. I don't know. I, we'll see. But... It's it's not like perfect. I, I wish I had like the perfect language and I like Clojure very much for being like super interactive and super yes. uh, easy to use, but performance, especially startup time, is uh, desires that's, to do better. That's one of the things that's been on my mind. And like, you know, that Rust, you know, essentially what's drawn me to Rust, on me to Rust is the performance. Like, but it's not just the performance because you can get the performance in C or C++ or a few other languages. But it's the combination of the performance plus the ability to express things, you know, at a high level. That said, one of the things that is really not great about just building UI in Rust is the cycle, you know, the, the compile cycle. It's not as bad as I think some people fear. Like, for example, in RuneBender on my machine, which is a fairly high-end AMD multi-core, the edit test compilation cycle is about three seconds. Which is not too bad. I mean, it's, I, it's worse than a lot of other, other, you know, things that you don't, think, you know, that you think of as being more dynamic than Rust. But you really want that. You want hot loading. You want that you want hot loading. You want Apple-like experience where you can just type something or just change something, and it's boom, it's instant. And so that is one of the reasons why I personally have been interested in scripting on top of Rust as a, as and. You know, like right now, most of the explorations that we're doing are Python scripting on top of Rust, you know, just because we use so much Python and font development, but no reason why, you know, you wouldn't be able to, to script some other language as well. Yeah, make, make Pat also do the interesting thing here. Like yes. I think the, the solution, they, they also acknowledge this problem with the recompilation and the solution is to save state on a server restart yes. the application and pull the state back which is yeah kind of smart yeah as well yeah don't know how well it works but well like, i suppose it works as well as with hot reload because in hot reload you, you have to keep state as well it just yes. in, it's in memory so and if you yeah. if you change too much so that all state doesn't apply you have the same problem with hot reload yeah <sighs> yeah there is a in the chat there is a joke about the best cross-platform graphical application is Doom. Yes. Which is ported to every platform possible, including. Yes. Yeah, that's, I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's funny. It, it, it is, it's interesting though, because like, 
you know, it does get you into some questions, which I think um, have been maybe a little confusing for some people that building a real GUI and building a game have some things in common. They're both doing high performance interactive rendering. But when you actually dig deeper into like what problems do you need to solve, it's actually pretty different. Like if you start with again, and so I think to my mind, like one of the topics in your blog post that I think is interesting is intermediate mode, right? And for a game, like if you're actually building menus or whatever, you know, game save type interactions in a game, then building that in immediate mode actually makes a lot of sense for a lot of good reasons. But I think those, those trade-offs, like it's really hard to do accessibility in immediate mode, for example, right? And so, and there's a lot of other things, um, you know, that game games tend not to like sub windows for things like context menus and stuff like that. It's all rendered in the same window. And so I think it's a little bit, like, I think it's interesting to ask that question of why not use game technology? Why not layer it? Like, and, you know, people have talked about maybe Godot is a good basis for, for building, uh, you know, start with a good game engine and build a UI on top of it. But I think when you dig deep, the, one of the reasons why games work as well as they do is that they oversimplify some of the tricky problems that you have to solve. People don't use IMEs in games. People don't do accessibility on games. And when you really solve those problems, I think it, it actually forces you to make some different decisions. Yeah, lots of games when I remember when you start a game and uh, like it asks for your name or something and you cannot type Kyrillic, you can only type English letters and like, <laughs> I can do that, yep. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, try, try the hard stuff. Uh, there's also a question about uh, fast compile tricks. Have you tried? Uh, I think it's so, a specific question, yeah. So that's a really, really interesting question. And um, the answer is that I personally have not done any of that, but there has been some experimentation. And so there, the, uh, I think Manmeet Man has uh, done some, uh, some exploration into kind of a hot reload using uh, dynamic uh, compilation or, or you know, recompilation dynamic linking. So um, uh, I think there are things that can be done in this space, even, even in Rust. And I think it's really interesting to, to keep exploring that, but, but I haven't done it myself. Hey, and uh, also, I, I, missed, I missed one question. Uh, this question is, uh, does it matter which language UI platform is used? Uh, and uh, the concern is that Clojure is not very popular. I think it, 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 it does matter. I, I agree Clojure is not popular, but uh, maybe I, I, my hope is that it will become like a um, killer application for Clojure. Like, uh, like I don't know, uh, there is a... Uh, you know, Spark or something like that. There's some application for Scala, like people using Scala Thanks. in big companies, they don't use it because like language, but because like some data processing pipeline is written on it. So yeah, uh, killer, application, killer application goes a long way in popularity of the language. It's actually yeah. like, it, it, it is maybe more important factors than the language itself, so yeah. I think so. The other thing, though, the flip side of that is when you when you look around at the UI frameworks that are being built, you'll find that almost every language has a UI a UI framework project, you know, to write the UI in Geo and Fire for Go, uh, uh, Reverie, I think, for uh, uh, for for ML. I could I could keep on going, right? That there's that there's all these things, that there's that there's all these things. And for the most part, they're not like if if you if your choice is, you know, you say, I definitely, you know, you say, I definitely want to write something in Go and maybe the US, then yeah, use Geo, that's great, or Fire or whatever. But none of these are yet, none of these are yet to the point where language because I want to, you know, because this UI frame, this UI toolkit is, I frame this UI toolkit is so compelling. So I think that's key. And like, I think Rust has a little bit of that potential, you know, to become the language that you come to. Although realistically, like I would say we're still in that category that if you really, really want to write your app in Rust for whatever reason, then you can look at Druid, um, 60 frames per second, uh, you know, ICD, uh, EGUI, 
uh, MakePad. Those are all, those, all five of those that I just mentioned, I just mentioned, I think are actually viable. Like if you really, really want to ship a, uh, and you've already committed to doing Rust, then I think you need to invest a little Rust. Then I think you need to invest a little bit in Polish. None of them are quite ready for prime time yet. I think you can, you, you can do that. So yeah, if you build a really, build a really awesome interactive GUI that's based on closure and it, it solves all of the really solves all of the really tough problems, the text processing, they, I can see people coming to that. That, that, that does, that does make sense. Makes sense. Yeah. That's my hope too. Do you have, by the way, do you have, um, like you mentioned five frameworks for us, do you have any feeling like which one is winning or are they all like the same stage or, um, or? um, so it, I, I potentially can get into trouble. Because uh, I don't want to hurt people's feelings. I don't want to under understate the work that's been done. Like all five of them that I mentioned, and there is other work that's being done. I I would say that I would say that those five are in one tier, and that that the ones that are kind of in the next tier are are really missing like important pieces. That there's important pieces. That there's the idea that you could ship real products, but we could, but there's there's more work involved. To my mind, they're all kind. Of to my mind, they're all kind of in this similar category. Like there's a lot of community interest. I also see some chal see some challenges, some ICD to solve these kind of really tough problems, accessibility at that kind that level. Um, I have good feelings about Druid. Uh, I feel like the work that we're doing on Druid is solid. That said, I am definitely not making the case that Druid is production ready. Like we are going to be making big changes to Druid if it's going to become. The real, the real GUI toolkit that that I kind of envision, and so if you invest in it today, if you say, "Oh, I want to build my product today in Druid," you're going to get, you're going to be dealing with the churn uh, under the hood. So I think they're all, and then MakePad. If people are not aware of MakePad, I know you've 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 looked at it. People really you've you've, you've looked at it. People really should be more quiet in terms of the rest community. But they've also been doing some really impressive work, and it's interesting. It's fun to watch. But they're building their own product on it, and I think if you're trying to build your thing on top, if you're trying to build your thing on top of a pain point as well, because they're not, they're not trying to solve your problems. They're trying to solve their problems. Yeah, I want to mention that MakePad has a really good white paper. Uh, it's a pretty short and concise document that outlines the main ideas and it's very interesting read. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not for the implementation, but the ideas themselves. They, they have, uh, oh, yeah. I think they have uh, the trick uh, that, uh, so the immediate mode uh, it has a problem that you can do complex layouts in it. Yes. And they have this trick when they uh, draw children first and then pass the size to parent and parent reposition the children after the fact they were drawn. So yes. that solves some of the problems. I don't think it solves every problem though. And that's the reason I'm, I'm resistant about the immediate mode UIs because like I'm always thinking about tricky layouts. Like what if I want like to make three buttons all the same width as the widest button, for example. It's yep. like, Right. You have to query the tree and uh, it's, yep. you know, it's it's probably you have to have widget somewhere persistent widgets I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a really interesting question and I think that um the you know, it's a trade-off because for, first of all immediate mode is sim mode is simple. And it's simple both to implement like when you talk about like implementing UI in games that I recommend people use immediate mode UI because if you're actually building your own from scratch, then it's much easier to get something running than building like your own, like your own retained framework. These routes are not for the faint of heart, which I have found and you have either found or will find depending on where you are in that. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, they're also limited in terms of the layout. And I think they end up constraining, like whether this is a good thing or not, that it, drives you towards particular like strategies for doing things like layout of what actually works in that flow. And I think that, um, you know, my perspective, uh, you know, people have different, different ideas on this. And, um, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is 
there's very little out there that's pure immediate mode. Almost everything is some hybridization where there's some retaining of state, there's some state, there's some, whether you want to station or caching or whether you want to call it something else, some division, like, you know, where you defer some of the computation until later in the pipeline. There's very little out there that is that pure immediate mode game loop where you like take input and then do draw calls based on that input. And then those draw calls go to the screen. There's you, there's screen, there's you, there's always some hybridization. And Makepad is taken a particular mode. Like they split the event path. Like I haven't followed the more recent work, but they basically split the event processing. And then they do the drawing in another pass. And then as you say, that drawing is kind of further, like it's not exposed as much to the uh, developer, but it is divided into two paths. Where, but it is divided into two paths where um, the structure of the layout is decided as you draw, but the actual geometry of where everything is lands up ends up is deferred, and there's a sort of a fix up path. Which, by the way, like when you talk about like just making the widths of the making the widths of the men of the consistent, that can be done in that kind of fix up. You know, you draw the button, you draw the button. You don't know how wide you're going to be, but you say. I don't really care. That's going to get fixed up later. And then you 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 do those. And then later you get this kind of constraint solver or whatever that says, okay, I need to make all of the widths of these buttons, you know, consistent. And you just say, all right, now I know what the widths of these buttons are based on, you know, based on my layout rules. So I, I think there's juice in MakePad. Like you can do a lot, can do a lot in that. a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of ability to like um, decide decide things in code. It's usually done in CSS where you have you have to kind of make it fit into the CSS uh, model, and I think that's going to let them do kind of more interesting animations and more interesting interactions that would actually be kind of a lot harder to do in, in a kind of web like web link framework. But they're also very very integrated, so they're like we need to solve this problem. Can we do it? Can we do it in the framework? Do we, you know, do we need to extend the framework to support this particular interaction? And that's easier for them than it is for somebody who is like adopting MakePad for their own product, which I think, you know, remains to be seen. I think they are, I think they are starting to think more about it more as a uh, uh, as a development framework and that framework and that people would be uh, their own uh, GUIs, you know, on top of their engine. Um, there is a comment about UI libraries not needing to compete. I think it says, uh, it's Adrian who wrote Membrane, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Membrane is a closure framework, which again, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is the idea is they abstract away all the platform details and only build high level stuff mm. like and mm -hmm. then like you can render with Kia, you can render with web, you can uh, like in rendering, event processing widgets, I think all the stuff is like abstracted already. If I am not messing it up, I haven't looked in details into it. Yet. Yeah. So. Well, those are good questions. And, you know, like I think abstraction is a very double-edged sword that, you know, it's appealing for the reasons that you, that you described, but there's stuff that is hard to abstract and when you're binding, like, again, like, if you think about, you know, a very simplistic interaction model where you just have keys and mice on the input, and you're just drawing to a 2D canvas on the output, then, you know, it's pretty easy to imagine abstracting that over all the different platforms. But when you're talking about an IME for text input, right, then that's a lot different surface. That's a lot more complex for one thing. And then it might work a little bit differently on Mac and Windows. So, you know, when you type, you know, option E to get a acute accent on a Mac, you expect a yellow box, you know, a yellow character that shows that accent that's ready for the composition to happen. And on Windows, you expect something a little bit different than that, you know, works more like the traditional dead keys. So at some point, you have to say, I'm going to break this abstraction. I'm not going to just give you highly abstract stuff. And, and the same, I'm picking that as one example, but I think it's also true for accessibility. It's also true for like the way that menus work, that one menu at the top of the screen on Windows 
And you know, so, so you have to address this question of how do you expose the platform specific details, the, the actual details that do matter for giving you high quality interaction. How do you expose those up to the developer so the developer can do the right thing with that? And um, yeah, I think the, like the philosophy of different languages of different languages is different here that Java would say, write once, run everywhere, abstract everything. You get an API that's provided to you by the JRE and maybe there's the next, you know, it says, yes, this is a Macintosh. Maybe there's an ability to say, if Macintosh do this, but it's the idea, the goal is that it's all abstracted away completely. And then, you know, kind of in the C tradition that you bind pretty tightly to the, to the platform capabilities and you end up writing code multiple times for those implementations. And I like to think that Rust is in the middle, that Rust in a lot of cases, and this is a cultural thing. This is not the Rust language definition. This is the Rust culture, that there's a strong tendency to say, there's some functionality that we need, whether that's, you know, take popping windows up onto the screen. Let's, let's, uh, let's make an abstraction, let's make a trait, let's make that cross-platform. So culturally, Rust stuff just works on Mac, Windows, and Linux, and then uh, some other stuff. But like those three, if it doesn't work on those three platforms, it's not considered real in the Rust world. And that's I think, a little unusual. Um, but then there's also this kind of extension mechanism. It's like, how can I get my raw window handle? That's all also there. So if you want, if you're on, a, on Windows and you have a wind and you wanna you know, access the accessibility API or menus or hotkeys or whatever through that wind, there's also a way to do that. So I think, I, I think we need to think about this. I, I, I think you, at some point you can get so far by saying, yeah, we're gonna have an abstraction. Uh, and then if you say everything is low level, everything is directly accessing the platform stuff, that makes things more painful. So I think, I think we need to find the middle, middle ground on that. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it's kind of approach we're taking uh, these, uh, I have a window management library because uh, we decided not to use AWT. And yeah, yeah we've, I've, we've dealt with EME, which is was well, not that hard, but it, it's certainly different. Especially, yeah. I think we found out that on Linux, like you cannot type uh, complex characters unless you using GTK or something like that, like in uh, X11, well, there's, there's nothing yeah, there's, for that. There's different traditions for how you do IME, depending on me, depending on, you know, so your, it's, you know, yeah. thing where there's no, there's no academy that says, this is the correct way to do IME, you know, do this and you're good, which, which does exist on, on Mac and, and, uh, yeah. And, and Windows, of course. But, but, but I think the solution is like to to find the middle ground, implement it as an abstraction, and then implement platform-specific details as well. Yeah. And right, if Macintosh do that, yeah. so that you have like uh, a possibility to do That's right. quality application, native application, but also common stuff. So like, it's not right once, it's right, right. once point right. twenty five or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, uh, returning to this membrane comment, I think uh, like the best I can say about it is probably finding a good abstraction and layer separation and make things reusable is a good thing. Kind of like if you wrote like, yes. a, I don't know, calendar widget, uh, there is no reason it has to know about ski jar or something like that. Ski jar. That's right. Yeah. I, I do agree. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's another comment. Post Compost currently explores how to do concurrent rendering. How do you think this influences the design of the library? Should it be planned up front or can be added later? Later. Super uh, good question. Hmm. Do, do you know something about concurrent rendering? Well, I, I'm not sure about concurrent rendering in Compose specifically. Are we talking about maybe? Are we talking about maybe we can ask the the commenter, is this specific able to, to exploit multiple threads so that you're not doing everything on like the UI thread, which is a traditional thing? Or is it more like React concurrent mode, which is a, a completely different thing that React concurrent mode is like, concurrent mode is like base commit to updating my render 100% that I'm actually going to, I, I think of it as more asynchronous or, or background loop. 
where you say I'm gonna impl I'm gonna update like the most important part, like the most important part, but then do like if you have like a scrolled view that might be updating later, and that's React uh, concurrent mode. So I do think this is a good question, and I think it, it profoundly affects the I do think it profoundly affects the architecture of your UI framework. That I think that um, we have when I talk about desktop UI being stuck, the fact that there's usually considered like one thread, the UI thread, and everything happens on that UI thread is one of the ways in which it's stuck. And then, the, and then there's, um, you know, and it's very difficult to layer in good, uh, good, uh, the, a, a good way to explain rendering, or not just rendering, but multi threaded interaction, you know, and then, you know, on top of that. Um, it's a hard problem, and I do think that if we're designing new things from that, if we're designing new things from scratch, that we should be thinking about how do you break those those single thread dependencies so that you are able to stay this part of the UI in one thread, that part of the UI in another thread, and join them later. And then you also want to do some pipelining. So if you look at Flutter, for example, that Flutter has pretty extensive pipelining where there, there's the pipelining where there, there's the dart runs in like, I think you can do multi traditional to just use one thread. And then that pans off off a render tree to plus plus, you know, um, render engine implementation. And then that hands that off to the GPU stuff. And then the GPU stuff is as much done in a separate thread, which is all pipeline. And it's a little, it's, a, it's all, the trade-offs here are very complex and difficult. If you increase the pipelining, you get more throughput. To get more throughput, you get much more likely that you'll hit 60 frames a second or 144 frames a second without losing a frame. But there's, but there's also a danger, and I think you see this a little bit in Dart, that it's see because you're you're kind of doing the GUI doing the GUI logic during another frame, and then. The GPU is doing another frame, so now you've got like three frames of latency in, in the system, which is which is not great. I'd like to I'd like to improve on that. So yeah, we got a confirmation that we're talking multiple threads rather than the React rather than the React concurrent mode. So I think what I speaks to that. Yeah, and uh, I think we experimented in window library. We, we we tried to do not exactly that. We tried to do thread per window. But I yeah. think we only be able to do that on Windows and on Linux on Mac. It wasn't possible, yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah so. it's 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 very tricky stuff. It's, it's very tricky stuff. the The biggest single thing that you want to be able to do is with this. You know, the most important you know, the most important thing to exploit in a multi-threaded design is pre-render expensive resources. So a lot of times you're decompressing images, or you're, maybe you're building a text layout. Maybe you've got like cards, you know, or something like that. And what would be nice, and what would be nice is if you all of the work to build those resources without impacting the main UI thread. So I think the idea of a main UI thread makes sense that you want to take that input, process that input into the rendering of the next frame as quickly as possible. So you want to you know, I think you do want to optimize for latency there. That's one of the things that people, I think, miss a little bit. But you might have, like, if there's an image that you're decompressing, maybe that's asynchronous. Maybe that maybe you're not going to block the UI thread for that to happen. So you farm that out. So this is where the, um, you know, uh, the what is this stuff called? The Grand Central Dispatch that you know is done on on uh, Mac is actually a pretty good uh, match for for this sort of thing. So you farm that out to some sort of thread pool, and you say, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna build this expensive resource." And then in your UI thread, you're you're gonna have some logic that you it makes the state management a little bit more complex because you're a little bit more complex because now you have to deal with ready or not, right? And you have to deal with both cases. But I but I do think that that um, think that that um, actually highly desirable if the goal is building extremely high performance uh, UI because it's a little ridiculous that we have like eight core machines and you're using 12 and a half percent of the capability, you know, uh, and you're janking, like you didn't render your frame, but you know, 80% of the capability, percent of the capability of the actual system was just sitting idle while it was janking. That's, that's sad. I got to just, I just 
yesterday when I was preparing the, the cover for the stream. If you can see, there is a background with uh, icons and the, those comes from SF Symbols, San Francisco Symbols application. So the Apple ships an application where you can choose the symbols, right? And when you type in search fields, it uh, it uh, lags because it has to update the render and process the typing. So it's uh, it's not a good experience. And I have like M1 Mac, which can do like amazing things, but it right. cannot like filter a list of icons, so unfortunately. Yes. And it's yes. like, I don't know, 20 icons per screen. So they're huge, they're not small, they're huge, they're like 20 or 30 icons. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I would say, you know, my perspective on performance is it's 2021. We have computers that are astonishing computers that are astonishingly amazing. And the fact that they would ever jank and the fact that they would ever, you know, not be able to update at 60 or 144 frames a second is is a failure of our engineering uh, capability. Why are we not able capability? Why are we not able to do that? Yeah. It's and so sad. that gets back to when when I was saying we're stuck. It's like for some reason, the UI frameworks that we're all using still have these sort of major performance, you know, bottlenecks. And uh, I think to some extent, it's just like let's let's just solve those. But but uh, it's I don't think this is uh, like a solution for UI framework. I mean, all those problems probably could be fixed uh, in the application itself. Like if only developers care, they could do it totally 60 fps without any junk they just yep. m maybe it's not very convenient for them i don't know yep. or or they just don't care so either of those yeah yeah and we you, want to make you, it easy easy to do the right thing that may yeah, be, that yeah, might yeah. be the best way to think about it think and you can optimize it. your i don't know tree traversal like uh, as hard as you can but then somebody came and does image decoding on main thread and the, yeah. yeah 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 it's it's um and that's that's a really tough trade-off and i think when you look at the success of react you know that they've kind of um optimized more for the developer uh experience than for, for performance like but i but i also think the other thing about react is that it's very pragmatic that if you have a performance problem there are these escape hatches where you can say i'm going to go in there and i'm going to manually say you know should component render or whatever that's called and, and fix those problems. So it's if you if you're way too performance focused and make the developer experience miserable, then you haven't really solved the problem either. Some some I like I just to contradict myself that what I just said. Uh, some of the problems I think are still of our own making. So I I saw a tweet from Gary Bernard I think yesterday. Uh, when he says like that we he used uh, like to do applications uh, OmniFocus 3 I think things and some other ones and he's going back to OmniFocus 2 which is I don't know five or seven years old uh, something like that because it's faster and like it's it's the same application basically but written in more modern technology and it, it's slower because like I, yeah. probably because developers computers are faster and so they don't care as much about performance so, yeah yeah and I, I i see that all the time like uh, I, I have a tweet deck which is like old implementation of twitter which is much faster than modern twitter i i use fast mail which is also yeah. like the web ui is very dated but it's super responsive and super snappy yeah so yeah the more you so, have, so, the more you spend, I guess. Yeah, so one of the things about performance, I mean, certainly performance is driving a lot of the motivation for uh, for the work that I do. Like, why would you even bother with Rust? And, you know, pretty much the answer to that question is, is performance, right? Um, and uh, one of the things that is interesting uh, is that there's, like, it's layers, right? So you have the top layer, which might be like your reactive model and whether you're using it, you know, like uh, immutable data structures and stuff like that. And then that drives down and there's all kinds of intermediate stuff in there about how you're resolving themes and and so on and so forth, which is, I think you can think of as the bread and butter of what, a, what most people think of what the bread and butter of what a UI toolkit does. Then you get into those lower lo layers and you might draw the DOM like around there, right? That DOM uh, abstraction barrier. Then you get into 
how to draw, how do you how do you schedule threads, you know, for do processing the different pieces of UI. Like some things get super detailed. Like um, if you're dealing with pen input, then uh, do you um, aggregate your pen? Uh, uh, you know, like if you draw a line, do you do you return like a a a, a list of a number of uh, samples of that line, and then have your UI process that? Or do you kind of dispatch your your UI every time? So there's a lot of like very hidden, like very low level stuff. I think you're also going to find that in accessibility trees. That do you need to rebuild the accessibility tree from scratch, like every incremental change to your data model? That could end up being a, a major performance thing. So the bottom line is you actually need to watch the performance like at all levels. That that's one of those things that is not just abstractable that, that you have to kind of you have to be able to like this is this is a, a way in which having too much of an abstraction can get in the way that if you can't analyze if you can't say where is my time going why is this frame janking then even if the things are fast right if you can't analyze like what could i be doing differently to make this render a lot faster then then you lose so so uh there's no royal road this is this is something that I was finding actually in the development of Xi Editor that you know I thought we were making some choices and like one of the things that was like super duper slow is when you change the theme, change the background color. But that like I was like optimizing for certain things that like typing and scrolling were like super fast because I had spent a lot of time optimizing that. But changing the theme was like 100 milliseconds, and I'm like, how did this happen? <laughs> like, what did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? Did, did it happen because you have to, I don't know, render some textures or like rebuild everything? Or? It it was happening because there was this process separation between the front end and the back end uh -huh. and that it was actually requiring like a lot of state rebuilding on, you know, kind of a, up and down this, uh, uh, you know, across the pipeline. Whereas that specific thing, if there was like one single process application, then you could say, change the theme, change the background color, next frame, you know, apply, just re-render based on the, the updated state. But there was, there was asynchronous stuff going on and, and you would be able to observe the intermediate states of the, uh, of the state. So a warning, don't do that if you don't have to. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe this is a good, uh, good opportunity to move to, uh, I wanted to talk with you about incremental stuff, maybe approach to incremental and state handling and stuff like that. Absolutely. Definitely. I I saw, uh, I think I saw a talk with you talking about Druid and I think, well, let me, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I just tried to explain what's going on in Druid. So you kind of have top-down rendering and some components can opt out of it if, um, the state that is get passed to it or props in React term, I suppose, uh, didn't change. And you do a pointer comparison uh, for, for that state. Is it correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Th that's right. And um, I guess, yeah, uh, yeah. So so there's maybe, a you know, uh, just, uh, just sort of explain it um, in my words. Druid is very, very basic. This is the current architecture, which we're not a hunch, we're not hundred percent in love with. There are things that are hard, like dynamicing, like the structure, like adding children to a to a to a to a to a you know uh, harder than it should be. But the way that it works is that there's this data trait, which fundamental data trait, which fundamentally is a when you say pointer comparison, implement that, but there's a same call that says, is this the same as as what there was? And so it basically does go from the root, it traverses your thing. And if it's the same, then it skips it, skips it. And otherwise a call called update. And then what update is gonna do, is this is a method on the widget trait. So what update is gonna do is that it's gonna rebuild things like text layouts or whatever else. It's also gonna invalidate, like invalidate. So it's optional, like, so it's optional. Like, do you wanna invalidate layout? Did your size of your widget act result of the data changing? If yes, then you call request layout in this layout in the update method of, of that widget. Uh, retaining any paint, but the this is something that we've always planned to do. And then what we are doing, so so Druid under that under the reactive um, architecture 
druid is super retained in flavor so it's doing like incremental repaint analysis like so you know if you don't call invalidate on a widget it, it if it didn't change it won't repaint it uh, on the next frame but yeah it's using the fundamental thing of what you said is is the core thing that's driving it that it's immutable data structures and it's basically testing did it change and then if it did change then you go into an update which is which is going to basically rebuild the expensive resources and that is a model of incremental computation that you can think of as being as being in the same ballpark as your self-adjusting computation or something like that. I, I, I think uh, I uh, like from my experience, I think it was what OM, the original version of OM and Closure Script World was doing. Yes. They were using like React and they also have like this global state, which uh, when you go down the tree, you tear it apart, like take a part of this state and pass it to, down to the components yeah. and they do like smaller comparisons. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I've heard that. I have, yeah, I have heard that. I haven't actually, I, I, I tried searching for it and I couldn't find like if you've got a reference to like a paper or some clearly written blog post or something that explains what's going on. But I have heard, I was at, a, I think, a Rust meetup a, a year or so ago. And so, well, it was more than a year ago because it was in person. Um, and somebody had, had said that, that the design reminded them strongly of the, of the closure uh, OM framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, it is similar. There are, there are several closure frameworks, but uh, yeah, I think that uh, what OM did. And, and, and it was based on React. And I think the, the main insight was that you can do this pointer comparisons because all your data is immutable and it's yep. fast. And, but okay, so, uh, but uh, I think there are some problems with this approach. And yes. one of them I think is that like top components have to know about all the details that children components will need. So you always go through yep. the route, like you kind of skip route, right? And yep. For large UI, it's probably not perfect. Yeah. And the second problem is, I think, uh, it's good if you just have like a tree or data structure That's right. and you take parts from it. But if you do some computation, like for example, you filter a collection, right? It will yeah. always be different result. It's like, it may be the same as uh, in content, but it will be different pointer because you just redid yeah. the filtering. So yeah. do, do you have any ideas how to approach that? Yeah, really good questions. Yeah, I, I think that um, you know we can go into details, but I think from a top level, what you said is a top level. What you said is exactly right. Tree model of your application state maps in a clean, clean, straightforward way to the, which you know we're doing a font editor, and a lot of the data does map in a very clean way. It is very, very a clean way. It is very, very a font check, right? You've got, you know the font, you've got glyphs, you've got components, right? You, 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 properties that are, you know, all very neatly assorted. So that part of it is working really well. But um, yeah, filter is one of those things where I don't think we have a super clean solution to that. We've done a little bit of work on virtual, virtual list type structures. And, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the directions that we've, we've gone and explored more than a little bit is, um, is, um, just being able to into a list and having an immutable data structure that computes that diff efficiently, right? That's possible, right? That's possible to do. A little fancy, like, you know, we use rope data structures. And so what you do is you sort of traverse into the subtrees. You say, you say ah, this subtree is the same as that I can fit. And so you can actually get a, get a delta out, you know, pretty fast and then use that delta to drive, you know, oh, I only need to re, recompute, you know, that part of the, of the render. But filter is not one of the primitives that we've currently implemented in that in that um, in that um, uh, framework. You might be able to do it. Like we went, like this is something that we've been struggling with a little bit. That to build a lot of that uh, logic, you use lenses, right? You say, and what this is speaks also to what you said about you know kind of the state at the at the top of the tree, and then you know how much does the top of the tree need to know about what's going on in the subtrees. Well, you can use lenses to do more sophisticated, you know, 
sophisticated logic at that point. But this is something that I think the developer experience is not great, that it's complex to, to reason about, complex to communicate. Like when newcomers come to our channel and ask like, how do I do X? And if the answer is build some complex, like build a complex lens that implements complex lens that implements filter, it's kind of a non-starter. Like people, people really struggle and, and we haven't built that stuff. Like, you know, we're just kind of like, you know what, let's just pre-render the whole thing. It's, it's fast enough, so. Uh, no, I, I mean, I think uh, it's it's a great model and it gets you yeah. very, very far. It's like yeah. lots of applications were written like in React and ClojureScript this way. Yeah. And I think the, uh, the only concern is uh, I have with this approach is maybe at some point you will need to optimize. Like as long as you don't need to optimize, everything is great. And it's, yeah, right. I like it's this model for simplicity, but I, I want to have like some opt-out, some some ability to point to a specific place in the tree, like just update this, don't touch anything else and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, there are in Druid, there are a couple of different escape hatches that you can use for that kind of thing. So. Like one of the biggest escape hatches, kind of the biggest hammer that we have is that we have this is that we have this command thing. You can send so we have widget IDs, and uh, you can send a command to a widget ID. And you can say, "Hey, widget X, do something." Like you know, insert something here. But that's really messy because now you have this thing where part of it is very functional and clean and declarative. And part of it is very imperative and like you have to know the widget ID that you're sending the command to. And, and so it's, it's possible. It's like a solution, the solution that, you know, if you're sparingly, then maybe it's good enough, but it, it, it's, it's an, it, it makes things more ugly to do it that way also. Yeah, and uh, one thing we experimented at JetBrains, uh, we have our own uh, UI framework, which started in Clojure, but then was written, rewritten in Kotlin. Um, and the main idea was like to truly go incremental, like all the way. So we have components and we have uh, state uh, that was tracking every read. Uh, like you have special values or wrappers for values. And if it, it is read, then component invalidates. If it doesn't, you can pass it through several components down and then open it up and then only the, the children will be invalidated. And right. it's like, uh, it's hard to understand. We had several bugs with it. I am not sure. I think it works decent now, but it's, it's tricky. That's that. I think that's a really important part, really important part uh, of stuff that, um, you know, you want to make it so that there's as few foot guns as possible, right? It's it's easy to say, oh, there's some requirement that you call like, you know, we get this, it's very easy to like forget to call invalidate or something like that. Or something like that. And, you get a, and, and a lot of times that bug is going to get hidden because something else is calling invalidate. So you don't see it, right? And then that invalidation logic changes, it gets more aggressive and you're like, how come, I, how come I'm not updating? How come I'm not showing up? And it can get very difficult to debug. So that that is, a, I think, a, a a generic concern and um, one that um, uh, I, th uh, I think in immediate mode GUIs that um, if you start doing the fancier stuff, if you start doing like the caching and so on, then it's a lot easier to, to get those kinds of, of, uh, of logic bugs. Yeah. And, uh... I, one thing I learned and uh, it, from from this experience was that we were doing like a lot of closures and the data reading was like implicit. So if some value gets captured by a closure, uh, it starts depending on it. And sometimes wrong, star, lo, wrong stuff gets captured. And because it's not right. explicitly stated anywhere, it was like... So yep. like at some point, like you blink your cursor and the whole UI renders. Why? Because right. uh, I don't right. know why. <laughs> so yeah, yes, that it happens. Shouldn't... Yeah. No. And this, yeah. this is sounding not entirely unlike the, uh, what is it called? Property bindings or whatever in Swift UI that there's like an object that, that holds the internal state. And the idea is that, you know, so they, they probably use a different model. What you're sound, doing sounds like pull, right? That the 
you're basically querying did this thing change right no no i reader. think it no it, it was push and if you push. if you change okay. something it goes to all the dependents and then it finds ah. a component and it adds this component to invalidate queue i see i see got it got it yeah so that does sound pretty similar maybe to the way that swift ui does it under the hood that you know in swift ui when you have a property what's it called property wrapper or something i the terminology is escaping me but there's an object and then when you use that object it actually builds a graph there's a gra there's an attribute graph under the hood and so and it, you know if you say you know my text is you know some something that's you know kind of a closure that uses the property value property binding as its source source of truth then if you update that then it causes the propagation of that through the attribute graph it says hey you need to you need to rebuild this string so it sounds maybe similar i don't know I have to check. I, I'm not that familiar with Swift UI, uh, so I will have to check that. I, I don't Un know. Unfortunately, Swift UI is very difficult to understand under the hood. Like I have made several attempts like to go a little bit deeper than just your average person. There are some good resources. There's I uh, can't remember the name, but there's a group that has like a book and like a series of videos. It's very good. I recommend that. But I, I it's one of the things that I kind of dislike about Swift UI is that it's, it's too much magic. It's all this complexity that's hidden and like all this work went into making it look good. But if you have to go in and customize, if you have to actually understand what's going on, then, then you hit a, hit a, hit a, uh, hit a brick wall pretty fast, unfortunately. So I like compose, like I find, like I read, you know, Leland Richardson's blog post on the post on the fundamental computational model. And I'm like, I actually understand this. I actually am on. There's some complex stuff going on, like with re recompose and so on. It's not compose and so on. It's not trivial. Uh, you know, fundamentally, like I get this feeling, like I know what the computer's actually doing. You know, under the hood, be doing. You know, under the hood. Yeah, and actually, when when I read about compose, uh, I'm I'm kind of happy. We I, I'm going to go with closure, and we had that actually at JetBrains as well because we start with closure. It was very yeah. easy for us to build these identifiers for code place location in mm. in source file, right? And right. you use that for generating keys. Uh, yeah. But in Kotlin, you cannot do yeah. that. You, and so they have to go with Kotlin plugin. And for yeah. a long time, they ship their own Kotlin. Now I think it's unified with JetBrains Kotlin, but we still like yeah. we cannot just upgrade the Kotlin version. So yeah, it's kind yeah. of annoying. Yeah, sure. But closure, closure, markers, yeah, it's yep. super power. Yep. We have that. We had that capability of being able to identify a code site. It was uh, done uh, uh, largely to improve debugging messages, like you know, returning an error value that you want to be able to identify, that you want to be able to identify where that came from. And so uh, that's been in there, I think, about a year. Uh, whether we want to use that or not, to use that or not is, a, is an open question. I did some ex exploration experiment out there called Crochet, which is like, Kind of a play on hooks like kind of a play on hooks like react hooks so what i think the way to describe what we were trying to do in crochet i think it was very inspired by react by react uh, by by compose uh by jetpack compose what we were trying to do is make it so that it looked like an immediate mode gui as much as possible but was an was a um uh was a re actual retained retained mode under the hood and i think it was an interesting experiment i think fundamentally there were there wasn't one single thing that made it not work well, but there were a lot, a lot of paper cuts. There were a lot of friction points. So I'm, I'm not actively recommend that people try to simulate the immediate mode GUI with the retained mode under under the hood. I think you can make it work, but I think that um, I think that there are some definite pain points. Um, what, what do you mean? Uh, how, what, what are the pain points? I maybe I missed it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, like, going into the detail on some of the. Like, I don't know how to describe it. That part of part of the pain point that we were having is just how to express things. To express things in a very clean way, right? And uh, things that we were struggling with is the nesting. So, you know, at the very lowest level, if you have a container, then you say, then you say, begin container. This is all using a sort of a a context, right? You, you're, you're saying I'm going to have a mutable context that I'm going to be 
so when you say begin container and end container, you're kind of pushing and popping on that context. On that context, how do you guess it? And it turned out that's that's not super easy to represent. Whereas if you have more of a rea uh, React style, VDOM style, then you just have a container object, and then it just has your children as children, and you figure out you know that that structure. There's no way that it can kind of get out of sync. Uh, by construction. So that's one example of, of, of a friction point, it's something that a friction point, uh -huh. something that that was hard to express cleanly. So, so, so you mean like uh, in React, you, you have explicitly defined like container class or component and in immediate yeah. mode, you just go with functions and you have to insert yeah. special functions. Oh, okay. I get it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Including nesting. Like there, like one of the ways that your UI could go wrong is that you could do a push, you could do a begin. And you could like skip the end, like let's say it's conditional, right? And then you return mm -hmm. and you're at a different nesting level when you've returned from the function. How do you enforce that, right? It's, a, it's that, the benefits of having got in the language. Yeah. I think with go to, you can exit from the middle of the loop and then your stack is something. I don't know. Well, there are ways. Yeah, there are ways you can express express that. You can enforce that. Like one way to do it is that you say, okay, you're gonna uh, like you're gonna uh, like with with a closure. So you're gonna say button without the the you know contents, and then when your closure returns, it returns. But there, in Rust, like, there are things that uh, that are not as clean when you have to use a closure. Like you know dealing with errors and stuff is is harder. Dealing with async is harder. That was one of the other things we were trying to. I wanted to ask about async, by the way. I, I read that you mentioned it, but I didn't understand what the idea was. Like, can you, can you explain the idea behind using async for UI? Well, OK. So I think that there's like two or three points which is important for UI. And I think the, the most important for, for a developer is there are certain things that are happening asynchronously. You are requesting a network requesting a network resource an image. You want a widget that has an image in it, but that image exists on a networked uh, connection elsewhere. And once you have that, you you probably want to use that for for things like what we were talking earlier of of just uh, you know even if it's in your assets that are bundled with your app. You may want to make that async just so that you're not having to do the decompression of that image on the main thread. So then async gives you, if you wired up correctly, which is challenging, like current Druid, we're basically not even trying to do async. Like you can kind of do async. Like you can kind of fake it but for, to, to make it really good. If you look at ICD, ICD has a pretty good async story. So if you, then you can say, um, you know, here's a URL and I'm going to hand it to a URL fetcher. And the URL fetcher API returns a future of content, whatever that's called. And you can pipeline that. So then you can say, okay, that's going to give me give me my JPEG, but I want to decompress. So you you give that to another. You know, you're basically doing a then operation on the on the future. And and then if you say, okay, that's what I'm that's what my widget is displaying, then you can write very clean code that just says create a widget that's that's a a decompression of well that I fetched from here. And then if you wire this up right, then your experience is extremely good. It's extremely good that you know you have to defend when you're in that polling state, you know, non-resolved state. But if you define that, then uh, then uh, you write it so that it's all as um, if you had written straight line code that was blocking. Um, so that's um, so that's that's I think the goal at a, at a deeper level. There's other stuff that's happening under the hood, like for example, when you're talking about rendering. Um, when you're talking about multiple threads, that it may be that async is a good way of saying, okay, if I'm going to, let's say I'm going to have a big giant list object with a lot of children, each child might return a future of, um, you know, of its rendered, you know, let's say of its VDOM, right? There's different ways to think about, but let's like re returns a VDOM that's, that's a future. And then, then you say, okay, now I'm going to render this thing. So I'm going to farm those out to farm those out to I get all those futures back of their VDOM nodes. So you now you need to be able to create a VDOM node in a multi-threaded way. Like you you know you, you don't want to have a single context. Um, but if you do that, then you can just join those when you're done. And maybe that's a maybe that's a lighter weight 
your weight uh, application of async because maybe you don't need to deal with those intermediate states where you're still polling. Maybe you say, this is still synchronous at the end, but, in, but while I'm in the middle of the computation, I'm using futures as a way, and I'm using async as a way of having all of the threads being able to make progress independently and exploit multiple cores in that way. Okay, so uh, let me reformulate it uh, in my own words and see if I'm get right or not. So sure. the futures are like, or sync is a good programming model that you want to be able to use from the UI tree. And, right. uh, but the, the, the trick is, so you start, it's easy to start the future from the render function, for example. Right. But then somehow when it finishes, you need to go to the same place and update that component, something. Right. So like hooking this up. Okay, I get it. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's I think it's worth the goal. Yeah, and we have, we don't have a sync per se, but we have a closure async. Uh, and yeah, that would be nice to have actually. Yeah. 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 It it has been bugging me because like I um yeah, because in React you also don't have a good story there. Like you have to render your yep. three, I think, all in one go. Yeah. And index DB is like asynchronous, so like you cannot query index DB and render something. Yeah, that's yes. this tension. A lot yeah. of the newer uh web APIs are built, you know, async. Like for example, if you look at web GPU, then almost all of the resource creation and resource access are async functions. You know, or pro I guess in JavaScript, you'd call it a promise rather than a future, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it makes it very, very painful because sometimes you really, really want to write stuff as, you know, blocking synchronous code, but it, it makes it, it makes it harder. So you have to kind of design your architecture around it. And it's a very different way then, then UI, you know, logic tends to get written. So it's it's a it's potentially a, a source of complexity. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I don't know about web web GPU being asynchronous. It's it's still as I understand web GPU is still like in development, right? It's not yes. like something ready to use. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's still like you. There's you know like it's behind a flag on most of the browsers. Uh, so you can actually do experiments, and then you can also do native web GPU. And you can think of web GPU as a good abstraction over the diversity of GPU uh, APIs that are that are out there. And it's kind of a cleaner, more modern approach to it. And there's some good implementations. There's WGPU, which is in Rust, and then there's Dawn, uh, which is in C C++, which is done by the Chrome people. And they're both like I I would say that if I would say that if the I would like to see these things mature to the point where you can just say, okay, if I want to do something GPU, then I'm just going to do it in web GPU. And then all these problems of how to abstract away the details are, are kind of solved, you know, solved for you. And that there's performance work and compatibility work that if there's bugs, you say, okay, you didn't implement web GPU correctly, but that's a motivation to fix the bug. Whereas you say, oh, there's some obscure driver bug that's causing this shader in my Rust UI toolkit to not compile correctly. You know, who who knows whether that's ever going to get fixed, especially when you're talking, especially when you're talking about the mobile world where there's you know huge uh, diversity of uh, of drivers and and a lot of compatibility problems there. What do you think? Where, yeah, uh, I, 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 it's probably like web community. Even though we like uh, a little bit criticized web before, I think they're good at arriving at cross-platform APIs, like that yes. everybody agrees on. And yeah, web GPU yeah. sounds like something very good because like OpenGL, DirectX, Metal, what's the what's the idea? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, since you mentioned mobile, what do you see thoughts on? Uh, unifying mobile and desktop it gets right. asked a lot people like i, I totally. get the impression that people like crave to write single code base for every device possible what do yeah. you think about it so i so so this it, what's ironic is that on my current role on the google fonts team researching 2d graphics rendering that most of my work is mobile these days uh actually i don't know if i have a 
uh, I, I didn't prepare this, so it might not might not go well. But uh, oh, here we go. So this is a little uh, demo uh, of what I'm working on now, where that's a variable font that's in Consolata, and you can see both the weight and the width uh, are mm -hmm. are varying, and all of the rendering is being done dynamically. So that's vector graphics, vector graphics basically, and so that seven minutes is how long nice. the the GPU is taking to render it because, you know, on a desktop, you, you have tons and tons of spare performance that, you know, to, 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 to burn. Uh, but on mobile, you're actually very close to the edge that if you want to do a reasonably rich and complex uh, UI, especially if it's including, you know, variable fonts and other kind of more sophisticated graphical uh, resources, that just being able to render that in real time is is challenging. So that's that's a lot is challenging. So that's that's a lot of what I'm working on there uh, these days. You of what you said in your uh, blog post that I think that there are there are I, I think the the whole Metro thing, modern Metro, whatever that Windows 8 was trying to do is I think we can look back at that and say it was a disaster that if you try to do a single unified code base to do both your mobile and your desktop UIs, it's going to suck at both. And uh, so, um, so, so, you know, so, so the Flutter desktop render uh, desktop and better, like I wish them well, but I'm a little bit uncertain, like a lot of the things that, uh, you know, these kind of deeper, harder problems, like, you know, the expectations of what text text input do and text management. Text input on, on mobile is, of course, you know, hard because you expect to use IMEs. You have these keyboards that have very complex interactions, but they're different than your desktop uh, experience. So I think that um, uh, it's, it's, if you are going to make something that, that a UI toolkit that works well on both desktop and mobile, that what we were talking about earlier about the sort of if this then do this interaction action you have to do a lot more of that and you have to do it a lot better than if you're just abstracting the differences between mac and windows windows yeah. do you think desktop is still relevant or is it like yeah. mobile it's, yeah 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 it's so my... so it's a good it's a good question because i think you do see more investment in mobile like and you know like when I was saying that saying that desktop UI is stuck, I think that to a large extent, mobile UI is stuck. That you see a lot of exciting things happening in the mobile UI space, in the mobile UI space, including Swift UI, Jetpack Compose, of you know work that's being done. There's exploration like you know making React Native work or some sort of. Um, there's a couple of different projects that have that sort of React Native-ish uh, flavor to them. Um, so I think people are more, people are doing more investment. They're doing more work to solve the problem. That they're doing more work to solve the problems on mobile. And I think that's one, one re, like the Flutter desktop and better that maybe, you know, being able to reuse some of that investment could could be uh, worthwhile. But yeah, I think uh, I you know like the types of application like the types of applications that most of them are creative in some way. Like font editing, like font editing, tech, you know, ed editing program, other creative apps, and those are not going to be those are be those are those are going to have a very uh, audio editing, you know, digital audio workstations is another thing that we we actually see quite a bit of interest in Rust because people really want the Rust so you can get the audio performance. You don't want to build, trust me, you do not want to build a digital audio workstation using JavaScript, using web technology. It just, like people have tried, people have, but it's just, it's just not, you can't quite get there from here. Um, so yeah, those applications I think are gonna be relevant on desktop for a very long time, even if there might be a little less, you know, investment, a little less energy going into it. Uh, cool, I, I agree as well. I, I know, like, I, I know that People use mobile a lot, but I don't know, maybe it's age sync or something like that. I, I just didn't get it. I, I hate using my phone. It's like, it's less convenient to do anything. And I like, I just love desktop and I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, but it's much more in demand. And that's why I think it's unstuck, as you said. And that's why probably why 
companies try to port stuff built for mobile to desktop because like uh, because right. they have something there and th that's at least something is better than nothing so yeah yeah, but, yeah. But yeah, there, there will always be, I guess, creative applications like, I don't know, font editors, graphics editors, yeah. OBS Studio. I'm sitting right now in OBS Studio and like it's pretty yeah. much desktop UI with yeah. lots of things yeah. and stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard the analogy of like different types of vehicles, of like different types of vehicles that you know, ours are the mobile and the uh, desktop is things like pickup trucks and so on and so forth. And it's like, it's not as many vehicles, but there's certainly a market. There's still a, a major category and you still need, still need to solve those problems. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose. There's a question about, uh, that, that says that we are discussing how UI should be executed, which we, I think did a fair amount of talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. but the question is about what do we think UI is and what are the building fundamental blocks? Yeah. Do you have anything to say about that? I'm, I don't know. I personally am more excited and more, I feel, I feel like I personally have a lot more thing to that first question of how to build. Like, I feel like I can solve, uh, you know, just systematically going through the problems, how to make rendering high performance. That's a large part of my work, but also how to bring all the pieces together. So how to bring all the pieces together for all the, and, you know, and, and so on and so forth. The, how, like wh what a UI, what a UI should be at the higher levels. I, I kind of want to say, to say, here's the foundation. Here's the, here's the building blocks. Here's the pieces you need. Then you go and explore Cause you need to do among other things. Um, you need to, need to do UX research. You need, you need to find out how people, you know, to study how people actually interact with these things. And uh, I think in desktop, we have the advantage that there's so many good models from decades ago that if you just sort of refine those, you can get into a pretty good state. But if you want to innovate, if you want to do completely new things, you have to sit down with users and see how they use the, see how they use the thing and of interactions confuse them, what kind of interactions, you know, make, make it clearer, uh, how, to, clearer uh, how to proceed. I don't feel like I have any a special great insight into that and and it's not what i see as my as my work i i really would be in a collaboration where i'm focused more on the on the first half of the question and other people on the first half of the question and other people the way uh questioning the value the importance of that i think it's it's equally if not more important not more important yeah i i suppose you cannot see about everything at the same time you you need to focus on one or the other and maybe switch i also think uh maybe this um this is a question that assumes some type of an answer so maybe adrian if if i get your name right i hope you get your name right because i think we don't never talked before maybe we should do another call with you and you will explain to us what like <laughs> how, what do you think you is uh and I guess I suppose I'm a host of a podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I I don't have a meaningful answer to that as well right now. But it might be interesting to discuss what you have to say about it. So yeah, let's let's talk maybe later. Um, okay, so we've been going for an hour and a half. I think it's pretty good runtime. We've touched a lot of points. Do you think? Mm -hmm. Do you have anything important we missed so far? I I feel like we've actually gone through. I was kind of you know thinking about your blog post, and uh, you know when we when we go through, you know we've we've touched on pretty much most of the topics. Uh, yeah, almost uh, almost um, systematically. So I'm pretty happy. Yeah, 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 maybe. Uh, the, uh, this is this is a is a prob uh, topic. But uh, do you know that UI frameworks like can do their own rendering, or they can do embedding native widgets? And my my point of view is like I've never seen a good UI built this way. Maybe I you agree. have different opinion. I agree. Okay. Okay. I, I agree, <laughs> and, and I, I go a little bit further, which is to say I think that the space has been evolving on this. That what that 
it used to be more that there was a native UI toolkit. So there was Coco and there was WinAPI. And these days that's much less true. That is it Coco? Is it Swift UI? Is it Win API? Is it, you know, is it, uh, uh, you know, Win, Win, I guess Win UI is the latest evolution of UWP. So are you going to mix and match like lots of different technologies? So I think it's more of a question of which technologies do you want to mix and match rather than saying, I'm going to make you a native wrapper because I don't think that there is any such thing as a native wrapper in 2021. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um... I think let's let's wrap things up. Uh, it was good. fantastic talk. I thought you I had a great time. Thanks for coming. And yeah, sure. I hope people find Very it inspiring. interesting. I great. hope to, and I'll maybe do some notes and rewatch this. And we'll publish this on YouTube for sure uh, for great. watching. Well, best of luck. I'm okay. really yeah. I'm just excited. Anybody pushing this space forward, I think you know we need people to do that. So I'm I'm glad we have thoughtful. Uh, motivated people like you doing that. Yeah, thank you. I, I like I do this for like for personal reasons. I find this stuff super interesting. Like it's probably one of the best, most interesting problem to work on in programming. So I agree. <laughs> Just like I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Great. Okay. Well, thanks uh, for having thank me you on. again for coming. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Take good, care. Good luck with your Rust framework as well. With Druid. Yeah. Definitely. Bye bye. Absolutely. Okay. Bye.